I'm going to say a few words about Conservative Friends of Afghanistan and the Coalition for Global Prosperity. I'm then going to introduce our speakers in turn, um, and I'll invite them to offer a few opening reflections, and then I will hand it over to, uh, to yourselves for what I'm sure will be a very lively and important discussion. So, to kick things off, uh, the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan is an influential <coughs> British group based in London and supported by a wide range of Conservative MPs. CFA's mission is to provide independent analysis and engage in campaigning, advocacy and policy work to improve understanding of Afghanistan's complex context and propose new mechanisms and solutions through influencing decision makers within the Conservative Party, Parliament and Government, British and US think tanks, media and the private sector. And the Coalition for Global Prosperity is a non-partisan, non-for-profit organisation that brings together political, military, business and faith leaders who believe that an active international development strategy working alongside um, an engaged diplomatic and defence strategy keeps Britain at the forefront of saving lives, alleviating poverty and bringing freedom, security and prosperity to those who need it most. So that's who we are and uh, I will now intro our first speaker who um, is Dr Liam Fox to my right. Um, many of you will know Dr Fox and his work at the top of British politics for uh, many years. He was first elected in 1992, he worked as a GP before becoming a member of parliament and has served in high office in both opposition and government, most latterly as Secretary of State for Defence and Secretary of State for International Trade. Dr Fox, over to you. Well, thanks. Well, thank you very much. Um, I don't think we need to beat about the bush too much uh, this morning. I regard what happened in Afghanistan as a betrayal. Uh, I think that uh, we uh, have seen the damage done to Afghanistan. The Trump agreement sold out a democratic government that we have worked very hard to build up with all the pain that that involved and it was just signed away to the Taliban in Qatar. The Biden implementation of the Trump uh, plan was utterly, in my view, incompetent uh, on a number of fronts. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the timing to make a troop withdrawal at the height of the fighting season when the Taliban were at their strongest. What, what did you expect to happen as a consequence? Um, the original plan to withdraw in May would have, been, would have been a better one, actually, had it been the later May. Uh, and to have that withdrawal shaped so that it ended up at Kabul rather than at Bagram, um, where um, the American military presence was much greater, seems to me utterly upside down. So I don't know what was going on. And I think the testament, testimony this week of uh, General Milley and uh, uh, Frank McKenzie, uh, the head of CENTCOM, uh, and as well as uh, Secretary Austin, um, has actually shone a light on the fact that the advice was to keep bigger presence on the ground to provide greater security for longer um, and that was ignored by President Biden. So I think that's number one is the damage done to Afghanistan. Uh, the second thing is the damage done to our collective security. Uh, when 5,000 of the most dangerous committed and violent enemies of the West were allowed to walk out of Bagram, uh, we don't even know where they've gone. Who knows where, where those people are but you can bet your bottom dollar that they've not forgotten how much they hate the West and will be contemplating their revenge. So the idea that we are safer in any way, shape or form as a result of this is a complete nonsense. Uh, and then of course, is the, there's the damage to NATO. Remember, we, we went there because there had been an attack on one NATO member and we all went as an alliance uh, with uh, Article 5 having triggered and we um, took the view that it was all in and all out. We would be in there together, we fought, in some cases died together and then the Americans withdrew unilaterally uh, without regard to the rest of NATO. Uh, that's damaging uh, to the confidence within an alliance that's already a little more shaky than many of us uh, would like to see. Uh, and I, I would pay tribute at this point to um, Ben Watts, who I think tried very hard to keep some sort of NATO 
Alliance presence going uh, at a time when it was it, it turned out to be actually impossible for him to do so. But I think that has gone a little unregistered, and I would like just to pay tribute to him. But when General Mackenzie said this week that Al Qaeda are still present, are still present in Afghanistan despite political assurances from the administration. I know which one I'm tempted to believe. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Uh, before I introduce our next speaker, for those who have joined us, you're very welcome. There are a few chairs to my right on this side. There are also chairs at the back, so um, please do help yourself. Our next speaker is Shabnam Nasimi, Executive Director of Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. Shabnam is a British Afghan social and political activist, commentator and writer. And Shabnam is the founder and executive director of the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. And Shabnam currently works in political communications and public affairs. Shabnam, over to you. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Ryan. And thank you, um, Dr. Liam Fox, for those honest and brutal remarks about the withdrawal in Afghanistan. Me and my family came to the UK in 1999 as refugees and we were fleeing Taliban rule then. And I think for me personally, the last couple of weeks have been incredibly difficult. I just never thought that after 20 years of sacrifices, billions in aid and the commitment that we made to the people of Afghanistan, we'd ever have to relive this sort of um, brutal experience again. Um, I hope that most of you agree that the last couple of weeks and the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan has been one that we have made, and and not and I, you know this is not this was not a uh, decision that Britain made independently. This was a uh, a decision made by NATO and Biden uh, uh, to to leave Afghanistan uh, at, uh, to remain at the hands of the Taliban, and this was a decision that we will. Uh, in the next coming months and years to come, uh, regret. Um, not only in terms of our own national security here in the UK and the implications of that, because before 2001, um, Afghanistan provided safe havens for the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Now ISIS-K also operates. So three different um, extremist terrorist groups um, are now operating from within the country. That should be incredibly terrifying for all of us. Afga Afghanistan's war and the geopolitical uh, situation there is not a war far, far away that has no relevance to us here in the UK. Um, I think sometimes when we fail to understand the country and probably why this withdrawal happened, um, it's because we don't understand that whatever happens in Afghanistan it has implications not only regionally but globally. It's the re it's you know one of the reasons why we went to Afghanistan in the first place, and I'm incredibly pleased that we are continuing this conversation. Uh, I know that we've had there, there's been a lot of media coverage uh, on what's happened over the last couple of weeks, but um, it is my objective and the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan and um, like-minded other organizations to continue this conversation because this journey is just beginning this is not the end of any war this is the beginning of one um and, and another one and we've got to make sure here as as a nation as britain that we work for our own national interests here in the uk and we begin to explore what britain's foreign policy means towards afghanistan independent of the us uh because as we've we've seen now the US is more interested in its own national interests than global security, and that's what Britain needs to do. We've got to work on finding a way to take a leadership role when it comes to Afghanistan. That's what global Britain means, and that's what the, the sort of position we should have globally moving forward. Thank you, Shatnam. Our next speaker is Major General James Cowan. James joined the army as a private soldier in 1982. After Oxford and Sandhurst, he was commissioned into the Black Watch and in his early years served in Germany, Northern Ireland, Africa and Hong Kong. He commanded his battle group in Iraq and served there again as chief of staff of a division. He commanded Task Force Helmand in Afghanistan. James is now the CEO of the Halo Trust, which employs 9,000 staff in 25 countries, clearing the debris of war. James, over to you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, on the morning of September the 11th, 
2001, I was uh, the military assistant to the chief of the general staff, i.e. the head of the army. Um, the news of the first aircraft hitting the first twin tower led to the convening of a chiefs of staff meeting, an emergency meeting in which the head of the army, the head of the navy and the head of the air force, along with the head of MI5 and MI6 came together. And from that day onwards, the next 20 years of my life was really shaped by the events that followed. Uh, as you just heard, in, in 2004 I was the commanding officer of a battle group in Iraq and I fought in Basra in 2006 and the great Iraq distraction really from Afghanistan is well known to most people. And I tried to learn the lessons of Iraq when I uh, then commanded the 10,000 strong British force in Helmand and I was there at the peak of the fighting uh, in 2009 and 2010. 64 of my soldiers were killed uh, during that tour um, and many more were wounded and I feel a very visceral sense of responsibility to them and their legacy. Um, I, uh, when I came back from Afghanistan I went to the first meeting of the newly formed National Security Council away day at Chequers. Dr Fox I think was present and at that meeting uh, the new Prime Minister David Cameron took I think the brave decision to carry on in Afghanistan and to commit until 2014. I think though there was a problem with that 2014 date because it then set, uh, set the time and uh, the Taliban have always said that uh, we had all the clocks and they had all the time. And from there on in, from 2014, uh, the Taliban began to think about how they could take power. What's taken place during August is, as described by Dr Fox, uh, a profound failure of statecraft. But we now need to think about the future. The title of this seminar is Afghanistan's next chapter, not, I think, a moment to reflect on the past necessarily, but to think about what we do next. I now run the Halo Trust. Uh, we have 2,400 staff who we put back on the ground four days after the end of Operation Pitting, uh, the evacuation operation. We're out there clearing up the landmines uh, not only left by the Soviets from 30 years ago, but now fundamentally the IEDs laid by the Taliban. And actually they want us to be there. I think we have to confront the reality of this situation. Because however much I want uh, what, what happened with President Biden to have been reversed, I know in my heart of hearts it isn't. And I think therefore there are three possibilities. The first is a liberal opposition formed around the brain drain 100,000 plus Afghans who have left, at some point the reinsertion of a moderate liberal Afghan government. I'm afraid to say, much as I would like love that, I just don't think there is a political will in the West to make it happen. The second and much the worst possibility is that we ignore Afghanistan, we deny aid and we drive a fissure between the moderate wing of the Taliban, the Kandahari Taliban around Malabarada and the hardliners amongst the Haqqanis, and that we create a civil war, and we inflict upon Afghanistan a catastrophe that follows this disaster. I therefore believe there has to be a realist middle way in which we swallow our pride and we support the moderate wing of the Taliban who are not committed to international terrorism, who want a conservative country which will not be in line with Western values but will be better than the extremism of Taliban Mark I. And we have a very short window of opportunity now to make it happen through uh, our decisions that we make in terms of international aid and the relations we form with that moderate wing of the Taliban. It's not nice, it's not desirable, but I'm afraid it's the only realistic opportunity we have. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, for those who have just joined us, you're very welcome. There are a few seats on my, to my right and there are a couple at the front to my left. Our next speaker is Laura Round. Laura is Director of Communications at the, the, the Sustainable Markets Initiative. Laura is also an experienced former Special Advisor, having served at the Department for International Development and the Ministry of Defence. Laura holds an MA in International Relations from the London School of Economics and is a Conservative Councillor in Kingston and Chelsea. Laura. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I just want to start off by saying 
how please Emma, how how Phil how busy this this room is because this is obviously such an such an important and profound issue and I I can't remember I know I'm quite young like Shadman but I can't remember as a grown up um, being so deeply moved and emotionally affected on a day to day basis by seeing what was being the scenes and what was unfolding in Afghanistan. But I also felt a real sense of pride of what the UK had done over the last two decades. A lot, of, a lot of things that I probably wasn't even aware of the extent. And hearing the accounts from Tom Tugendhat, Jimmy Mercer, and lots of other um, people who served there, and either in the military or through organisations and charities, um, I felt really proud of what we've done in, in strengthening institutions and what we've done for women's rights, etc. And also. So Liam's point, seeing Ben Wallace and also James Heapy, who's here today, um, strike such a right tone and also show real humanity um, during that period. But that sense of pride um, was also shared with a profound concern about the message that the West was sending to the rest of the world during that time. Um, now, obviously, I wasn't, I've left government a while ago, so. I watched this unfold without any inside knowledge, and whether this is right or wrong, it, to me, the West appeared completely disjointed, and, and probably frankly, weak. And um, that, that I think is one of the things that really shook me. And I think we can be so proud of our values, and should continue to stand up for what we, but you know, the social progress we've achieved, and that we are advocating for around the world. And I know we're living in an era of woke, and even though I'm a millennial, I'm still trying to navigate this and what the rules are, etc. But I think it is so important that we remain pr proud and are strong in advocating for human rights, women's rights, um, and democracies around, around the world. And I was, I would like to say to James, I was a tad nervous coming onto this panel because we've got people who've served in Afghanistan, we've got people who lived in Afghanistan, we've got a former Defence Secretary, but then I remembered how privileged I am as a woman to even have, have the opportunity to, to speak. And um, I found these words by a girl who spoke, which was said in 1999, and sadly I think they probably ring as true today as they did back then, where she said, living under the rule of a Taliban regime is like being in an abusive relationship. At first it's good, they make lots of promises, they watch their steps, they even deliver on some of their promises. But while you are being lulled into a false sense of security, they are making their plans. Soon and little by little, as the world gets bored of Afghanistan and the media moves on to another news story, they tighten their power grip day by day and the savage cycle begins anew. Now, whatever the news cycle and things that are being thrown at us to um, grab our attention constantly, there's so many, I think, as I said previously, we cannot afford to ignore Afghanistan. Um, and finally, I just want to say a few roles on, on the importance of UK aid and the role it can play. Um, I think you know it, it's right that we continue our, our support, uh, our humanitarian support. Uh, I think it's right that we um, encourage, as much as you know, whether naively or not, encourage the Taliban to um, to support uh, girls' education and to have an inclusive Afghan government. Um, but also, I think the role of UK aid in, sort of, um, in the region, for regional stability, and also the organisations on the ground, like UNICEF, like the World Food Programme, like the Halo Trust, who have earned and like, really got the trust of the local community is, is so, so important. And I know we've just had the cuts of aid budget and we're going through lots of challenges here at home, but I think to me it just shows the signal of a strong United West and the role of soft power and showing that we care and standing up for our values and the role that UKA plays in that is just, is completely very vital. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Our last speaker is James Heapy MP. James was elected as the Member of Parliament for the Wells constituency in 2015. Before entering politics, James served in the army, reaching the rank of major. James served on operations in Kabul in 2005, in Northern Ireland, in Basra, 
in Sangin in Helmand province in 2009. He also served in Kenya and James is the Minister for the Armed Forces. Minister, thank you so much for being with us. Um, thank you very much indeed. And um, in some ways, we say that I don't have tons to, to add. I think Liam's diagnostic of what happened uh, since the signing of the Doha Agreement is, is right. Uh, there was going to be a decision on Afghanistan this year, whether we liked it or not, from the moment that that arrangement was, was signed. And the decision would have been to have either uh, recommitted and been willing to fight because the deal with the Taliban had expired and the Taliban had been perfectly in their rights to have wanted to take us on again or to leave. Um, and as a veteran, uh, alongside James, uh, and actually I, I know having worked for Liam and having been uh, uh, in the army whilst Liam was Secretary of State, that even at the political level, when you've got something like Afghanistan happening, you feel very personally each and every loss. And we reflect, I think, a wider national security community uh, within the British government who desperately wanted everything to be all right in Afghanistan. And notwithstanding the obvious choice that was approaching from the moment that the Doha agreement was signed, I fear that there was an optimism bias within the national security community within the UK and probably within the US because we all desperately, desperately wanted Afghanistan to be okay. Um, and this summer was hard. It was hard because the Taliban were taking back over control of a country that uh, I had fought to keep them away from. Uh, it was hard because people to whom we owed a debt because of their service alongside us during that campaign needed to be brought out of that country and we simply did not have the time to bring them all out in the immediacy of the Kabul air bridge. And it's hard because I don't sit here now with any confidence saying that it all will be okay. Um, but none of that, and if you'll indulge, I, I, I'm, forgive me for sounding like a stuck record because I have said this many times in the media when I've been given the, the platform to do so. None of this very necessary analysis of why we're in the situation we're in and what comes next should in any way deflect from the <coughs> courage, sacrifice, brilliance of the nation's armed forces uh, throughout that campaign. By poor coincidence, it happens that two of my platoon colleagues from Sandhurst are in this room, and those of us who commissioned in the early part of the 2000s, we commissioned in 2004, will have had our, not just our military careers, but our lives shaped by service in Afghanistan. And I know that many veterans, myself included, will have asked ourselves whether it was all worth it. And I just say to, to Banksy, to Sam, and to everybody else who is veterans alongside us, that what we did in our six months each time was worth it. We achieved something that was special, that we gave huge sacrifice to achieve. And all of the politics that must now follow doesn't in any way diminish that. The situation now is difficult. Um, we left behind 311 families that we had called forward, that we'd phoned up and said, come to the airport, we're going to try and get you out. That was made all the harder by having to say with what I knew to be about 36 hours to go, please leave the airport. We know there's a suicide bomber on the loose in Kabul and it's going to be deadly. Um, that was a really crap day. Um, 311 therefore didn't get on flight. Since then about 10, have made it across borders and have made it back to the UK. And I'm afraid that that illustrates the challenge that we're now facing in getting people out of Afghanistan. It's not easy. Uh, the Haqqani control the access to Kabul International Airport and the main checkpoints uh, out of Kabul, and therefore people getting away under their own steam and into a third country by land or air is proving extraordinarily challenging, but we're working on it. We have schemes that probably aren't for discussion in any public forum, um, but our commitment to those people remains absolute. And of course, it's not just those whose applications were completed and had been called forward by the end of the airlift, 
There are hundreds more that had applied during the period of the airlift and since, whose applications we are processing, and the Prime Minister has been clear that ARA is neither numerically nor time bound. Everybody who meets the eligibility will have the right to come here if we can get them here, and we're working hard to do that. I was in Uzbekistan 10 days ago. Uh, my colleagues uh, in the Foreign Office and the Chief of the Defence Staff are in constant contact with Pakistanis. Um, we are having discussions with the Tajiks. Um, I'm not sure the Turkmens are uh, much interested in discussion, um, and I wonder quite how we're going to handle those who leave via Iran, but that's work in progress as well. Um, but our commitment is absolute, and we are not going to um, close the doors and say that Arab is over until everybody who wants to come has had the opportunity to come. Um, and we are in hope that at some point commercial air travel will probably um, re return uh, and that there might be an opportunity to get visas for people in a normal way, which the Taliban respect, but there's no there's no certainty around that. It is, it is hope and we continue to uh, apply pressure. And that's my final point, because I think that what James said is, is wise. Um, the reality is, is that there needs to be levers the international community can pull, but I'm not sure that there is real international consensus over what to do in Afghanistan. Some big countries have left their embassy open in Kabul. Some big countries have said that they will continue to have relations with Afghanistan uh, under the Taliban just as much as they did under the Ghani government. Um, some of Afghanistan's neighbours prefer to say that there is no crisis and that they want to get on with their cross-border infrastructure projects and trade relationships in just the same way as they had been doing previously. And that, I think, is a challenge for uh, our diplomacy over the coming months as we try to work out what the levers are that countries in the region and more generally international community are willing to pull. The message I got in Tashkent two weeks ago could not have been clearer that by freezing Afghanistan's assets, the international community is causing a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Now, that, I think that's a flawed logic, and I think that to unfreeze the assets would be to uh, recognize the Taliban, and I think that recognition of the Taliban must be something that they earn, not through all of their spin and PR, but through demonstrating how they intend to run Afghanistan. And I don't think that it is going to be the liberal democracy that we hoped to have been building, but at the very least, I think there are some expectations that we can have of them that they must live up to before they are recognized. But we should be alive to the fact that in freezing their assets, in, in pausing the aid relationship, uh, there is a danger that we are exacerbating a humanitarian challenge. Um, we can't rush to recognize. Nor, though, as James rightly notes, can we wish away the fault lines within Taliban internal politics and the reality that it is not yet clear which part of the Taliban will end up in the ascendancy within Afghanistan. And there's one part of the Taliban that I think that we can sort of hold our nose and uh, work with. And there's another part of the Taliban that we would find utterly abhorrent. And we're going to have to work out when the right time is to recognize, work with, and try to build a relationship with Afghanistan through which we can have some greater confidence around the future relationship. Um, so that, ladies and gentlemen, I, I sort of, um, I've learned that the best way to communicate over Afghanistan is with brutal honesty, because frankly, to be anything but um, just is insulting to those who risk life and limb to go there and fight. Uh, it's insulting for those who are still there and are fearing for their lives. And I wish that I could sit here with greater certainty. Absolutely everybody in the Ministry of Defence <coughs> is focused on our moral obligation to bring out those who served alongside us. Absolutely everybody in the Ministry of Defence has their eyes wide open to the possibility that international terrorism could return to Afghanistan and how we would counter that if we did. And absolutely everybody in Her Majesty's Government has their eyes wide open to the fact that within Afghanistan, beyond those to whom we might be able to bring out, there are tens of millions more people who must now live under the Taliban and they cannot be forgotten because to Laura's point about keeping Afghanistan in the news over the last six weeks, Afghanistan was hardly spoken about for the five or six years beforehand and there is a real danger that Afghanistan disappears from the agenda altogether once again.
that would be to betray the service, the British Armed Forces, and everything that they did there, not the fact that we're in this situation right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. The room is packed, and I'm sure uh, many of us here have lots of questions, so I'm eager to turn to our audience shortly. Before I do, let me kick things off by expanding on a point that Laura touched on in her opening remarks. My question is, um, and I'll perhaps start with you, Dr. Fox, um, to what extent has the withdrawal emboldened the West's enemies? Well, there have been a number of um, geopolitical shifts as a result of what's happened. If you want to get it into winners and losers, um, the winners uh, will be China, Pakistan, Iran, India will probably be uh, less uh, geopolitically stable in the region than it has been. And when we have the sort of lack of cohesion that we've had, uh, James described it as a failure of statecraft. When you, when you get that, then naturally those who don't wish us well or who take a different worldview than we do will want to test us. And what happened in Kabul was being watched very closely in Moscow, was being watched very closely in Beijing, watched very closely in Tehran, uh, all areas where we may face uh, security challenges. And I'm afraid in politics you are only as strong as your last act, not your last speech or your last press release. And we will be viewed by what we have done, not what we had previously said. Uh, and that, I think, is what bothers me most of all. Great. Uh, can I have a show of hands? Sam, just gentleman by the pillar on the right-hand side here. So I was at Sandhurst with uh, James Heavey, and General James was my first commanding officer. Uh, and since leaving the army, I work in the uh, development and humanitarian sector. Um, General James, what, short of a resolution on working with the Taliban or recognising the Taliban, what can government do to enable humanitarian organisations like your own to work effectively in the, in the interim? Yeah, thanks, thanks Sam. So it's been a pretty searing year for, for me. I, I thought I'd left the army, and I thought I'd left war behind me. On the 8th of June of this year, um, a group of armed men walked into one of my uh, unarmed camps and uh, called for the Hazara to be paraded, the, the racial minority for those who don't know Afghanistan. Um, my team bravely refused to identify anyone who was Hazara, even though most of them were Pashtun and could have done so to save their lives. Uh, the insurgents then opened fire and murdered 10 of my staff in a, in a mass uh, a horrific incident. Two then died of their wounds. Um, in fact, what happened after this was that the, the claimants were not the Taliban, it was ISIS who did it. And the Taliban went after uh, these insurgents and have yesterday uh, found some of them and some of our kit has been recovered. Um, why do I mention this? Because this is a very, very difficult, complicated country where nothing is quite what it seems. And I think now the West has to think coolly and rationally about what it can do. By cutting off uh, the money supply, we are on the brink of precipitating a collapse economically, which can only instill yet further complexity and instability. So how do we get around this? I'm afraid to say it's not going in the right direction, because last week the Head of Trust was given its financial settlement for uh, the forthcoming spending review. Now we've all heard about the one third cut to aid, but the cut that's coming down the line for the clearance of landmines and IEDs is 81%. I've had at peak 3,500 staff working for me in Afghanistan, brave men and women going out day after day, and some of them, as I've just described, paying with it for their lives. Um, I've lost 1,000 British funded deminers. I am the largest British NGO in Afghanistan and not receiving a beam of British money. None of that money comes through the government of Afghanistan. None of it goes to the Taliban. All of it comes, or should come, directly to my NGO and the people who work for me. And we are anti-corruption. We're pro-efficiency. We're pro-doing the job. Why is it that the British cannot get their act together to address this? We must start to think coolly and rationally about the future 
and it makes me angry what's happened in the past, but it makes me a lot angrier about the complete inaction that seems to have gripped the body of Whitehall at the moment. Yes, please, uh, Madam. Uh, Thelma Mattock from Sutton Coalfield. A couple of points. I think the um, debacle, the mess that happened in August, illustrates the disconnect we've got between different government departments. So how is that going to be addressed? And the second point is I agree with the Major General. I think um, we need to live with what, what we've got, the Taliban's in there. And I think the quicker we open, reopen the embassy there and have a, a basis there, then at least we can also keep an eye on the Iranians, the Russians and the Chinese and maybe find a way to work with the Taliban because I think that's what we have to do. We've got to live with what we've got. Thank you. I wonder, Laura, can I ask you with your perspective, having served in two Whitehall departments, uh, to comment on the first point about government departments and then Chapman, I may come to you for the second point. Yeah, it's something that I found quite striking as well and um, it's certainly something that was played out in the media a disconnect between especially around visas and on the ground uh, and to the extent that was true as I said earlier I was obviously observing it as an outsider and just seeing what was being portrayed in the media but that definitely came across really strongly um, secondly I, I played a very very minor minor role but um, in trying to get people out of Afghanistan and we got 12 people out of us sadly still people there that we're, we're working on but by playing a small role in that, I was exposed to um, nothing to do with the MOD, just James, <laughs> on the table, but other departments, there clearly was a disconnect that became quite apparent uh, that officials weren't talking to, other, to each other in particular. Yeah. There's only two other departments at play, it's a home office and a foreign office. And um, I found that uh, surprising uh, and, mm. and, and a real shame because that's what was said today. We knew this was coming at some point this year, so how how was that not prepared for properly? And so I think that is definitely something that needs to be looked at really seriously going forward as to how do we avoid that in future? How do we make sure it's more linked up as we go forward um, in, in looking at, to James's point, um, the other people that we, we can bring out? But yeah, I, 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 as an outsider, I agree with your observations um, on that. Sorry, um, thank you. Well, look, I think we're going to have to begin to accept the reality that the Taliban are in government now. Every single day, I get calls from family, friends, um, and activists and politicians and people who've served in, in the former Afghan government telling me that a huge, huge human, human tragedy and a crisis is unfolding. The fact that I have to get a call telling me that in Kabul markets, people are having to sell their children to survive, that's shameful. It shouldn't be happening in the 21st century and it, it's, and it shouldn't be the result of 20 years of intervention. And so I agree with your point that despite the fact that we don't share the same values as, as the Taliban, this is a group that has proven time and time again um, that they're not only against the Afghan uh, population, but also our Western values. Um, Unfortunately, we have to find a way to get, navigate through this. We have, yes, abandoned in, in many ways the Afghan people militarily, but we've got to make sure that we don't abandon them in, in a humanitarian way, in a diplomatic way, in a political way. Women's rights is one of the, the, the sort of the core um, principles at risk in Afghanistan. Um, they, anyone um, going on to higher education, uh, girls are not allowed to, to school to go to school anymore and this has been the, the, the commitment uh, of global britain and, and britain generally over the last 20 years in afghanistan uh, to ensure that um, girls get 20, 12 years of quality education that has been taken away women are told not to go to work anymore and that if their job can be done by a man then they have no role in society they are being imprisoned in their homes and i think for Britain generally, and the fact that we're a leading humanitarian actor in the world, it, it is a, not only a moral obligation, but it's a responsibility that we've taken up upon ourselves. We've got to make sure that we can, that we remain committed to Afghanistan in whatever way possible. Now, the next step, while it's very, very uncertain, is that how do we form that relationship with the Taliban? 
we are very far away from recognizing the Taliban as a government, and understandably so. Um, many Afghans do not want the Taliban to be recognized in any way. Um, then how do we reach the 40 million population? That's the question that remains something that we've got to shed more light on, and it needs to be a conversation that continues, because the UN is not playing a role in Afghanistan anymore, neither is any other country. 40 million people will starve and will die, in, whether it's through violence and war or through hunger. And moving forward, in terms of the, the role that the UK will have, it's, it, we're going to have to pay a lot more closer attention in terms of how we engage, not only with Afghanistan, but the region. Because as Dr. Liam Fox has mentioned, our, our enemies and people who don't share our values, China, uh, I've read the news, I think it was yesterday or the day before, that they're now in Bagram, um, uh, air base where we used to be um, so yeah, that's another huge catastrophe the fact that China is now there and will slowly begin to begin another occupation a Chinese occupation in Afghanistan I mean that the fact that I, I can't even put it into words and this is a reality China is in Afghanistan um, m many of these countries will manipulate the situation will use it for their own political gains for their, for their own <laughs> geopolitical interests and we've got to keep a very clo close eye. Afghanistan should not be abandoned. And uh, whilst um, uh, James Heapy mentioned that potentially the, the, the agenda in the country might fall off the radar, it, it, it will be shameful if that does happen. Whilst you know, we've got to make, separate political engagement with the media. If the media is not covering it, does, that does not mean that, that the political attention and engagement also ceases. So. This is a very long conversation to be had, and it needs to be had very, very soon. There's a hand that's been waving at me from the back. If you just waved it again, that's who I'm looking at. Yep, please. Thank you. Edward Cromley, Cambridge District Council. Um, I, I believe very strongly that. I do think that Joe Biden, I don't know how he looks himself in the mirror in the morning, that deluded geriatric who purports to run the United States has no idea of the sheer desperate situation he has unleashed in Afghanistan. And I'm really glad that you brought up the of women and children because I think they're the ones that have been betrayed the world most. I've got two daughters. I've brought them up to be strong women. The same has happened in Afghanistan. You've got mothers over there that brought, brought their daughters up to be strong women. And they are being betrayed. We gave them, by our intervention over 20 years, hope. We gave them hope that they could grow up, they could take a part in society. And that hope has been pulled away. I think if we are to... Uh, do something like uh, resume and, and carry on with the step the oath we have got. That should be on the one condition that those women and, women and children and daughters have that hope restored, that they can go to school, that they don't have to be sold off, that the daughters aren't being married at 13, 14, 15 to Taliban fighters. That is abhorrent. That is, should be the one case that we continue to give them over. Those girls, those daughters, those mothers have the hope given back to them that they can be full members of society because what's happened now is just disgusting. And Joe Biden, I mean, I cannot understand. America has troops in Japan, they have troops in Korea. What, what is the difference with Afghanistan? Why could they not have kept the troops there? Mm. I just cannot understand it. And I think, you know, I, I do think, Dr. Fox, if you have any intros into Joe Biden, just tell him. <laughs> Democratic. I, mean, I think the, thing, the first thing to say, of course, is that while, as I said, the, the agreement was implemented in uh, an incompetent way, the agreement did come from the previous administration. So I think this is, I think it was, it, it, it didn't have to implement it, but of course the, the agreement was signed under the previous administration. So I think it's a failure of American policy rather than any one particular administration. And I think that on I think the problem that you highlight is a very real one because it does come to this question of engagement with the Taliban. Mm -hmm. And I think that recognition or working with the Taliban or releasing of any funds has to be dependent on what they do, as Jim said, not what they say. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it will take time for them to prove that they can actually uh, be trusted to uh, respect the assurances they gave in the Doha Agreement. Um, and if they do, then perhaps we will be able to work with the more moderate elements of them if they show that they're willing to stand up uh, for the very things uh, that you mentioned. I have to say I'm not hugely optimistic that they will. Uh, but it is, I think it's incumbent upon us 
to take the time to try to see if we can find a workable way through. Uh, because we have responsibilities much more than just geopolitical uh, uh, pride uh, and, and making these things work. But I, I'm against this idea of saying that we should unfreeze assets and automatically recognize the Taliban because we want to encourage them to do things. They have to prove that they have done things first and then we can gradually uh, unlock the levers that we have. Gentleman, third row from the front. Thank you. Ali Mirage, political columnist at the article and a former uh, foreign affairs advisor and national security advisor to the party. Uh, I think the, the, the lesson that I take from this is that after 20 years, this is an indication that the neoconservative prescription utterly and patently failed. Uh, it was hubris and it was overstretched. The question is not why Joe Biden left now. The question is why the US didn't leave 10 years ago when bin Laden was killed in northern Pakistan. What were they doing there? Uh, you know, we're not in the business. I mean, this, this whole state building thing completely and utterly failed. So it should have pulled out a lot quicker. You could contrast it with um, George Bush Senior's uh, intervention in 1995 in Iraq. The, the war was over in five weeks. They knew exactly what they were doing. It was tightly controlled and they got out. This was just completely um, a mess. And you, you see Blair talking about the West being an epoch-changing retreat. We should have never been in this mess in the first place. And, and Liam says that uh, he worries about the message this sends out to allies. Allies already priced it in. I remember meeting Musharraf in 2001 in London, who said that we were going to extract as much bounty as we could from the West. This is him talking. Um, because before they ditch us again, a reference to what they did in Afghanistan in 89 when they pulled out support when the, the Soviets left Afghanistan. So it's priced in. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, look, I think those two questions actually come together because um, when we first announced the integrated review and with it the sort of reshaping of the, of the army, I remember uh, CBS was on, Nick Carter was on the Today programme and uh, in that sort of gotcha style that they enjoy, it was like, aha, well that means you couldn't do another 10,000 people in Helmand indefinitely. And Nick's answer was, well, we would, would we want to? And I think that there are lessons that have been learned from the last 20 years about how uh, Western militaries can and should intervene in parts of the world where the interest is threatened and where there's a desire to get upstream of a conflict or to shape uh, the, 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 the politics in a way that is um, more accepting of a rules-based international system and sort of being good citizens in the national community. And I think that's what the Integrated Review gets after, that we're not a sort of interventionist, ground-holding, state-building military. We're sort of more into sort of capacity building and shaping upstream. Um, but the challenge is, to the lady's point around you know, the conditionality of aid, well, I agree with her. And as I said in my remarks and, and, and him and others have agreed with you. Know, we, we shouldn't rush and we should, the Taliban need to make the first move in demonstrating with actions, not just words, that they are someone who deserves to be recognized and have all of the uh, interactions around aid and diplomacy that, that, that come with that. But we also have to be clear that in this type of uh, situation around the world over the decades ahead, we don't get to do that entirely on our terms. We don't get to say, here are the list of criteria that you must meet in order to be a friend of the West, and when you have met these criteria, we will be your friend, and for as long as you don't meet these criteria, we will not be. Because there are other countries, our competitors, China and Russia most notably, who will set the bar far, far lower, and will come in and be the friend, and will scoop up uh, uh, all of the um, relationships uh, that come with that, without asking any of the questions, and with that comes a debt, diplomacy, a, 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 a debt dependency that gives huge leverage, particularly to the Chinese. And so we're gonna to have to ask ourselves some really hard questions. Because on the one hand, our instinct is to set the bar high, that the price of UK friendship is that you live by our values. But if we are too absolutist about that, we'll find they've already gone off and made friends with another country and our opportunity to influence and shape has gone. And that's the very difficult reality of the world we're now in. That's the very difficult reality of this um, systemic competition 
that will shape the next 20 and 30 years of defence, security and foreign policy. Um, and it's going to require some pretty frank conversations within government and amongst those of us who would regard ourselves as liberal conservatives, that actually you know, our advocacy for freedom cannot be quite as absolutist perhaps as it once was if our adversary is willing to go in and uh, be friends without asking anywhere near as many questions. Okay, I've got two questions from this side. So, fourth row from the front, your hands have been up first. Yeah. Sorry, just oh, come to you next. Um, sorry, um, ben Austin, Jake, team. Um, I'm a former army officer, uh, I served in the infantry, and I was uh, also a veteran of Afghanistan. Uh, General James, you're actually my brigade commander uh, in, on Herrick 11 uh, in Sangin. Um, I served in the operational mentoring liaison team uh, with the 2nd Kandak and with the Afghan National Army. Um, my question really is to, in the way that we've seen the, the Afghan forces capitulate, not really over, overnight, as the media imply, but withering on the vine over 18 months since the, the Doha agreement. Um, to what extent do you believe that, even as far back as 2009, when, when I was embedded with the Afghan National Army, did we actually make a fundamental strategic misstep in the, the manner in which we were setting the conditions, the, the shaping of the Afghan forces? that's led to their collapse over a long period and effectively compounded that, that mistake over a period of 10 years? Yeah, I think it's a really, a really insightful question. Um, I'd like to link it to the last one. I mean, the, 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 what we've seen really is, a, is 20 years since 9-11 that divides into two decades. A heavy-handed interventionist decade in which all the things you're talking about happened, and then an isolationist decade. I think what we should be trying to forge is a a new and cleverer way forward that's more agile, that's lighter, that's less expensive in lives and money. Um, you know, actually there were only 2,000, there were few, fewer American soldiers in Kabul uh, in the last couple of years than there were American employees in the embassy in London. It's, it wasn't Vietnam. They hadn't had a casualty since 2017 until the airport bomb. Why was it such an appalling drain of uh, blood and money? It literally wasn't, it's a, it's a myth. So we should have been able to come up with a lighter, touch way of doing this and, and one of the great conundrums of this is the as I'm afraid that as we cut the size of the army and we spend more and more on high-end sophisticated technologies the degree to which a bunch of men in flip-flops armed with AK-47s were able to defeat the most sophisticated militaries in the world why is it that we in the West do not know how to invest in training indigenous forces so that they are not corrupt that they can stand on their own feet and they are not too reliant on overly complicated bits of kit that they simply can't work. That's the lesson we should be trying to learn from this for the future. And what I'd like to see is, and I'm afraid the integrated review does not achieve it, is the integration of things like what I do in my NGO uh, with what the military does and with what the diplomatic service does. There is no sense of true integration, a new British way to make, to put some flesh on the bones of this great strap line of global Britain. It's an empty, uh, empty piece of rhetoric which needs to be turned into something useful for the future. And I think we should be trying to work very, very urgently uh, to work out how we address the problems of the world without costing lives, without costing too much money. Um, um, Councillor Marcus Lapser from Coventry, and I'm won't want to concentrate on the next chapter because I had the privilege to go to Iraq three times, uh, especially with the Syrian Kurds crossing. And um, listening to General James, and I'm sure that we have a duty of care after 20 years, and we have failed. Uh, if, you, if you just look at Iraq and the Yazidis, the genocide in 2014, the Yazidis, that's off the news. And we cannot allow Afghanistan to be off the news. We have to keep it a, as a high priority, especially with the NGOs. I worked with the NGO Calcer Aid, and they were a small organization, but they made such a difference in Badaresh camp, just like outside Erbil. And we've got to get away from saying, we have to be friends with the Taliban. There has got to be a new way to from the port, whereas we negotiating one sort of aid, but then directing the aid to the NGOs would get into the front line. Look, I think one positive that I've seen so far just from this event is that everyone here wants to continue this conversation. And I'm honestly so encouraged by the British population and the, the support that they've given over the last couple of weeks. 
not only for the re uh, newly resettled Afghans who have, have arrived in the UK, but also just in terms of how ashamed they feel with the, with the withdrawal. So we, Britain has clearly shown that they don't want to forget Afghanistan and that's incredibly um, encouraging. But I think in terms of how we continue this conversation, for me personally, it's about ensuring that the government, uh, the Foreign Office, the International Development Department, um, consult with Afghans and consult with organizations like the Halo Trust um, and other stakeholders who understand Afghanistan, have the expertise, know what the last 20 years has meant. It's one thing that I haven't seen as much over the last couple of years. In, in the initial stages of our intervention, there was a lot of consultation, a lot of engagement, a lot of conversations. It started to sort of go downhill, after, I think after 2014 with, with the British troop withdrawal. But we've got to make sure that the government understands that in order to ensure that any future policy in Afghanistan, the new conflict strategy that, that's, that's been um, uh, uh, focused on, and so many others that will, of course, impact Afghanistan, has a direct, uh, the, the government directly works with those who understand the ethnic makeup of Afghanistan, the geographical, uh, the, the religious landscape. Generally speaking, Afghanistan is a very fragmented tribal and Divide, divided the country. It's probably one of the reasons why the conversation continues and why we ha why we weren't able to win in Afghanistan. Why is it that this war was lost? And my personal perspective with this question was that we just have failed to understand the people and the politics and what the, 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 the country needs. Um, so for me, in order to ensure that this time next year, we still talk about Afghanistan. It's about ensuring, first of all, that there is direct consultation with those who have supported British interests in the country over the last 20 years and British mission. And second of all, it's ensuring that organizations like ourselves and uh, like-minded, uh, who have like-minded objectives and, and missions continue to host events like this. It, it doesn't take that much to talk about, about Afghanistan. Sometimes we think it requires a lot of expertise, a lot of, you know, a, 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 money it, it, it doesn't it just requires you know you've just got to have the interest for the country and its people and its politics and if we hold our, not only our representatives to account but hold uh, the international community to account and, and international organizations they will keep pushing this agenda it the, the only way that this will fall off the radar is if people don't um raise it and, and don't have that conversation ordinary uh, people like ourselves um, and, and hold uh, the, the, the people that are responsible and the decision makers um, to account. So I, I hope that you will continue to pressure and put pressure um, within your own organizations, within your own workspace and, and those area, places that um, are, are related to foreign policy and work on um, issues around Afghanistan, that you ask them to hold platforms, that you ask them to uh, hold meetings, that you ask them to consult with the government and it just requires a lot of effort, uh, and it's something that we all have responsibilities to do. Oh, Minister, and then Lord. Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to pick up with uh, something on the, 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 the answer before last from, from James about the interaction between NGOs and contractors and the uh, and the military as envisaged by the integrated view. Because I think actually, James, the, the plan is better developed than you than you give it credit for, and I, I accept. I don't know the detail of. The, the Halo Trust, and therefore uh, I don't know your own personal experience on this, um, but across Africa already, where we are involved in the sort of capacity building activity that we think is um, the sort of mainstay of our future interventions, it is very much something where a military force is working alongside contractors and an NGO community into to, to deliver a sort of wider effect. Now the problem with that is that our funding vehicle for that sort of activity has been CSSF, uh, which is uh, an annual uh, funding cycle. It is required to be catalytic, and I think that if you are if you are campaigning over the long term in order to cement a relationship or to to shape a strategic outcome, you're not going to be able to demonstrate in-year catalytic effect from from the funding. So I think that there is, whilst I think the sort of the idea is within the IR, 
and indeed it's something that we are living already in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a bit wonkish, but I suspect there's a number of people in the room that I know exactly that know exactly sort of what I'm getting after. But that funding vehicle that has been used for so many years is probably not the right funding vehicle for that sort of activity that needs to be over a far longer time frame. So I think actually the conversation that needs to follow now the IR is written is so what for the way that we fund long-term activity. And instead of looking for catalytic in-year effect, how are we looking for a 10-year outcome on our investment? And how do we give program certainty that over that sort of time frame funding will exist? Because that's when you start to get into a really strategic place where you end up with a relationship between the UK armed forces and the Cameroonian armed forces or whoever that is sort of really institutional and deep and that's when our adversaries can't muscle in and we've got real influence over the direction that that country takes in the future. Laura. Thank you. Um, just building on the question of how do we continue to ensure it stays on the agenda, um, I think Shadlam already indicated you know, there's, there's a clear role for um, <coughs> parliamentarians to keep this as a, as a topic in, in Westminster but also for us who are in the room and, and as constituents to, to, to show and demonstrate that there is an interest in this because I think politically, especially around elections when you go on the doorsteps, foreign policy is not usually the first thing that comes up. Um, so therefore, how do you make sure that we do continue to uh, look at also the wider um, perspective and context of the role of global Britain. How do we want to portray ourselves going forward when there's so much happening in the world and, and you know, lots of challenges that many have been mentioned today and, and the shifts and in, in power dynamics and what have you, and, and in particular that comes down to value. So, so what do we want to stand up for? How do we want to position ourselves? And also for younger generations who, um, this might be the first time they've seen this on, on, on television, sort of, you know, as a, as a topic that really penetrates through, through the news. How do we make sure that they understand and feel pride in what the West is doing and, and aren't sort of too insular or become too woke and sort of like, um, not ashamed, but sort of, you know, understanding that there's so much to be proud of and, and there's a real role for us to play and that we should stand up for and stop you know, just being so apologetic but actually standing up for the women's rights, the human rights, democracies and all that that brings so I think there's a wider context what is the role of global Britain I think that does deserve to be much higher on the agenda and there's a role for all of us in the next two years to make sure we keep up that pressure So, Premier <coughs> just have to boom. Oh, I'll just have to shout. Uh, Robin White, until recently, I was an honorary colonel in 77 Brigade, which for some of you would know is the Army of Information Warfare Brigade. Um, and uh, my question is, is to you, uh, General, and to the Minister, it's, it's about the issue is, have we really cracked and found an ideology for our new non-kinetic strategy? Uh, it's, it is not just about the Army not just about uh, your sort of programme, it's about bringing in reservists with special skills to help in the new world. And I don't think we've quite worked out. I developed at 77 Review the concept of information peace fair as my way of describing a new integrated way of soft and hard power working together. So I think there's a bit more thinking to be done to really crack that, and, that, and it will be very relevant in the future of what we can do in helping in Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, Minister, do you want to go first, or do you want me to? Uh, no, go on, James. Yeah, so uh, I totally agree that um, we live in an age where the binary nature of war has ended. It is not simply about uh, friendly forces and an enemy forces. It is a far more complicated array of actors uh, who have uh, varying interests and roles and, and trying to understand that complexity and extract some sort of simple operating uh, conclusion to it is really, very difficult. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with what James said. Uh, I, your question was about sort of the messaging around ideology and peace fair, sort of winning influence without resorting to to war. Um, and James is right that the sort of the, 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 the last resort, being able to apply uh, relentlessly lethal effect, is 
is the only decisive tool when all other options fail. Um, and I think we retain the ability to do that within the Western Alliance. Um, but I think that our year-on-year, month-on-month activity is to shape and institutionalize friendships. I was in Colombia last week where our relationship with the Colombian Armed Forces and the Colombian Police date back to Reagan and Thatcher and an intervention around narcotics and 30 to 40 years later is so deep, so trusting that we have enormous influence the, and, and, and huge success, 45 tonnes of cocaine removed from the trafficking route between Colombia and the UK already this year. Now imagine the policing effort that would have been required for that. So this investment upstream in forging deep institutional relationships with key regional partners has enormous value, but you have to be patient and you have to invest in it. And that's why the Rangers and actually the Security Force Assistance Battalions and the redesign of the Commando Force into the Future Commando Force and this use of the literal response groups, which is sort of uh, an afloat forward presence uh, working within a region permanently, is a way that the UK is sort of permanently forward, permanently visible, permanently communicating our values, permanently winning influence, permanently developing those institutional relationships that become decisive. I don't know, and the bit, the bit I'm unclear on, I thought Liz's speech was a breath of fresh air to a foreign secretary advocating for freedom and a community of nations that believe in freedom and democracy and a rules-based international system. And in an age of systematic competition, we have to be more comfortable talking in that sort of language. But we also have to be clear that whilst there's a community of nations who believe in that absolutely, the community of nations that we are competing over in terms of our influence and our ability to uh, avoid conflicts in those parts of the world aren't going to buy in absolutely to the model. One of the key tensions at the moment is lots of countries that I visit will say without any hesitation or any apology we want a security relationship with the UK and US. We want a financial and trading relationship with China. And they see no reason to have to choose. Now, is that something we're comfortable with? Is that the world in which we operate? Or are we going to force a choice? But these are the big foreign policy, the big geostrategic decisions that we have to take in the time ahead. Are we going to advocate absolutely for an ideology of freedom and democracy and adherence to a rules-based international system? Or are we going to accept that Friendship with those who will come near enough is better than them falling into the other camp. And I just think this is a real inflection point for UK foreign policy and for the way the Western Alliance does its business. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by the debate, but we haven't got the answers yet, that's for sure. So I think there are a number of balances and choices in that. In, in, in the military question, it's been, uh, in recent years, there's been an increasing sort of debate around do we choose between platform numbers and the size of our forces uh, against increased technology, including cyber? In fact, it's, it, it's not a choice of one or the other. We have to have both. Uh, we have to have the ability physically to apply lethal force when it's required and then hope that the other instruments that we have make it less likely to be required uh, that we apply that. It is a much more complex picture, as James says. And I think we've got to be brutally uh, realistic about uh, the world in which we face and following on what uh, Liz Trust was saying yesterday. We're in a world now where, as we said at the beginning of this discussion, our enemies are actually going to feel emboldened uh, now, uh, not in retreat. We are the ones in strategic retreat. Uh, we need to change how we uh, view the world around us. The Chinese, for example, are trying to make the world a more permissive place for totalitarian governments. We've got to try to make the world a more permissive place for freedom and the rule of law and democracy. And that requires a conscious effort on our part, not simply reacting to events in the world, but actually having a strategic vision along with our allies to make that uh, a reality. I also take up the, the point about, about Global Britain and Whitehall. Whitehall is still largely shaped for the Britain that was in the European Union. Whitehall needs a proper shake-up. We need to change how Whitehall looks so that Whitehall looks outside, so that we are primed to make our own decisions in all of these areas, so that we are able to take a more proactive role in terms of geopolitics and pushing the values that we have. Um, you only have two feet. You're either on the front foot or the back foot. Uh, we probably should better decide which it is.
a show in Egypt, I'm a former contributing editor on Newsweek, and I was in Afghanistan um, <coughs> about 2006 for um, not very long, but long enough. And um, I wanted to ask, how was it? How was it that we failed to see that the strategic reasons that we went into Afghanistan haven't changed? You know, we are still, we're still in Korea, we're still in Germany. The strategic reasons for that haven't changed. You know, we went in to stop um, it being a national garden of terrorism. We went to stop. Russia and China getting in there. We all these reasons that we had for going there. Um, we want to stop the heroin being sold here. We obviously <coughs> went in for the women that we did, well, we stayed to help the women and children. So apart from the moral reasons that we should feel appallingly ashamed of what we've done by abandoning Afghanistan, which we really should, strategically we look like quite complete idiots. What lessons have we learned from this? Why did it happen? How can we make sure it doesn't happen? Dr. Dr. May, come to you first again. That's okay. Yeah, kind. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, let's 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 not rewrite history. We did not go to Afghanistan to apply better rights for women. No, but we, we stayed no, there. No, and, to, and we went to Afghanistan because uh, of the 9/11 attacks and because Afghanistan was harboring uh, those who were responsible for that. So we went to Afghanistan for reasons of national security. That's why it was a NATO mission. And we largely achieved that in a, mod a, a modest time that we did yeah. remove the, the threat from that. And I think James described it very well, that actually we had that kinetic period where we actually dealt with the enemy. And then we had, with a decreasing and decreasing number of troops and budget, we had a position where there was relative stability in Afghanistan. That is why I think the evidence given by uh, Gen uh, General Milley this week saying that the President Biden was advised that keeping 2,500 troops there was a relatively small price to pay to maintain that security that we fought very hard for. Um, and I think it's this absolutist approach that we have to have no troops there. We have to have no advisors acting. Uh, we have to have no air support uh, uh, for the government of Afghanistan. It, it was that absolutist position rather than a balanced, mature position understanding what we had gained, what we paid to make that gain, and why sometimes at a relatively low premium you have to maintain that to keep those gains. Um, I think, again, to echo James' words, it's a failure of statecraft that we got to this position. Can I just give you an insight into something else I think is really important? This is the, the slow closing in, the slow darkening that accompanied uh, British attitudes to Afghanistan. I took uh, Ruth Davidson um, out to Afghanistan for a visit and uh, she was expecting to be able to travel to Mazar al-Sharif, to Herat, uh, to visit our programme and I was stood up and ready to do it. We landed in Kabul and we were told by the British Embassy that they changed their minds, that uh, the, the whole visit would take place within the confines of the Embassy. So we travelled all the way to sit in an office. She was furious. And rightly so, because the reason why they wouldn't let her out is because they themselves were not going out. They had ceased to travel. The, the health and safety culture that had taken hold meant that their eyes and ears, their understanding of what was happening in Afghanistan had basically become more and more curtailed. What we witnessed, I think, during August was, I think, a, a great success for the Ministry of Defence. Uh, their leadership was good. Their organisational skills were good, they cancelled leave, uh, they were where people needed them at the right time. I'm afraid that wasn't true for other bits of Whitehall who didn't cancel leave. Ministers didn't come back, officials didn't come back, they didn't work 24-7, they weren't there through the night. There are still thousands of emails unanswered. This is a failure and my charity works closely with other governments, the Germans, very organised. Why could the Germans be organised and not the British? It's a, it's a shaming, and we've got to get through it. Just quickly, I'll add to, to your question. Um, and I think James is absolutely right in that um, we failed to understand what our intervention meant in Afghanistan. And not only militarily, but in terms of the gains over the last 20 years, any polls, any sort of anything that I've heard when it comes to the British public on Afghanistan and why we were there, if you ask them, should we remain and was it a success? 
the majority of the responses that I hear is no, it wasn't a success, we lost this war and there's no reason to stay. It's, it, my perspective is that we failed to convince the British public of why we're there, why we went there in the first place, and what it means not only for Afghanistan and the region, but for our safety here in the UK. What I would have liked to see over the last 20 years is our leaders continuing to raise the issue around Afghanistan in the House of Commons, but also talk about the gains and successes. We don't talk about what we achieved as much as we should. Britain had a huge, enormous impact on Afghanistan. Over the last 20 years, when, when, when Britain went into Afghanistan before 2001, sorry, in, in 2001, it started with a black, blank canvas. There was practically no infrastructure, no system, no schools, no hospitals, nothing. I traveled to Afghanistan every, pro probably every year after 2006, and I began to see the transition and the change. And honestly, there was such a huge shift in, in people's rights, people you know, understanding democracy, their right to vote, their right to go to school, their right to access to, he to health. And we sometimes assume that Afghanistan should be a developed country in 20 years. The West wasn't created in 20 years. No developed country in the world is what it is today after in, uh, in such a short amount of time. To, to assume that it should stand on its own two feet militarily, it should protect its, you know, itself, the government should be self-sufficient. Afghanistan has always been a foreign aid dependent country. It, it has never had its own economy. So we just generally, when it comes to our intervention in Afghanistan, we fail to understand what, why we went there what difference we've made and to convince the British public of the importance of our intervention there and our basis there. So I think that's probably why the general sentiment around the British public against the intervention and against the war and remaining there and, and our commitment is what's the point. So I, I, I would have liked to see more um, promotion of our success and more uh, uh, discussions and, and more of our leaders and, and, and representatives talking about what it means and what we've changed and I didn't see as much as I, sh I would have hoped to. I'm afraid of risk of starting a pattern I'm also quite keen to challenge James's last comment as well um, I'm afraid James I um pitting was the one international evacuation plan from Kabul that survived contact with the situation in Kabul when it came. A number of other western countries partners asked to use the Baron Hotel as their evacuation handling centre precisely because op pitting had been so well planned and was being so well executed. It's simply not true that there were not ministers and officials working around the clock. They were because I was one of them that was doing so. People were brought out in huge volume. No other country on earth beyond the United States brought out more people in that period than the United Kingdom did. This myth about Germany's success was principally their ability to bring out their nationals and entitled personnel, mostly concentrated in the north of the country, from Mazari Sharif. They are still facing many of the same problems as we are around those that would be their equivalent of Arab, hence why we are in discussion with them about how we work together to bring those people out. I appreciate that emotions run high over Arab and those that were left behind, I feel it acutely. But I will not hear that what happened in those 10 or 12 days when the British Armed Forces, the Royal Air Force and 16 Air Assault Brigade particularly, were doing what they were doing, supported by real-time ministerial decision-making and decisions by officials at the highest end of Whitehall, that was an extraordinary operation of which we should be proud. Everything that went before, everything that came since, discuss. But James, I'm afraid that that, that's, that's another characterisation of what happened. I think I chose my words quite carefully. I, I will repeat what I said. I think the Ministry of Defence did a really cracking job, and the ministers were present. Uh, they cancelled leave. Um, uh, the, 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 the operation was extraordinarily well planned, uh, and I completely agree with everything you said. My words were chosen carefully, not about the LOD. We're almost out of time, so I want to take uh, three or four questions in succession, and then we'll take. Um, lady in the white.
example of that if people in other countries have got the basic human rights, that means it has an impact over here. I usually get questions to say, what's, it's not our problem in Britain if something's happening over in Iran, Afghanistan, Saudi. But it is our problem because we've now realized what's this happened in Afghanistan. It has an impact on everywhere else in the world. Now, I know that we're witnessing this and it's really hard to actually look at the following chapter, but one thing I wanted to say about the role of what has happened in the US and Biden and the role that we want to play in the global Britain, is there going to be any question and accountability on the 180, 800 billion arms, US arms that were left in the hands of Taliban? Is there going to be anything that's going to be done on that? Is there any accountability on what the US government has done? Thank you, Matthew. Uh, thanks. Uh, Rob McKellar, Self Conservatives. Uh, we are rightly placing a great deal of hope in the opportunity presenting itself to work diplomatically with the more moderate wing of the Taliban. But in the event that that opportunity doesn't present itself to the extent that we hope it might, our duty to the Afghan people remains unchanged, but we're suddenly faced with a much less palatable set of options. What then becomes our position? Sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Councilman Redding and also write about geopolitics. My question is in two parts. One thing, uh, when it comes to Afghanistan, there's an elephant in the room which we haven't mentioned, which is the Pakistani ISI agency. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly everyone knows that Kani Network is the vertical arm of Pakistan, a Pakistani ISI agency. The same Kani Network which grown up hospitals, killed children in the school, and killed our armed forces. So why the money which we, uh, and former head of the ISI has said we took money from the West in the past to defeat Russia. Now we took money from the West to defeat the West. And that's what that's what he said. Now why that money can't be squeezed from such agencies and put into Hello Trust, which is doing a fabulous job on the ground. And my second question is education. Now the education is taken over by Taliban in Afghanistan. And one thing the Afghanistan, uh, Taliban fear is not the weapons, it's education they fear. And now they're going to radicalize a generation of a uh, coming generation, which will be radicalized, and their heart will be filled with uh, towards the West. And research shows it's just take one year to radicalize a teenager. So what we are doing about the education side of things, and what we are doing about this elephant in the room, ISI, uh, which is the Pakistani agency. Thank you. Lizzie. Yeah, so Lizzie, I'm from Bedford and Kempston. I'm slightly <coughs> in agreement with the question that you've just asked, but I want to go a little bit further on the fact that it's not just the last 20 years. Afghanistan has been occupied by countries and empires going back centuries, right back to the Alexander the Great and his 100,000 strong battle hardened army originally. So, what do we have to learn, not just from the last 20 years? But going back the centuries as to why things haven't worked out. Thanks, Lizzie. I've, I've been quite unfair on our panel because my next comment is to ask each of them to comment on a selection of those questions and perhaps wrap up in about 50 seconds each. <laughs> so starting, from my, starting from my left with Laura, who I know needs to shoot off pretty quickly. So, Laura. Oh, gosh. Um. <coughs> Um, yeah, that's that's a very wide mix of, of questions, and I'll, I'll I'll cheat slightly and use my fifty seconds to just reiterate one of the I think very important elements of of Britain's world and the uh, Britain's role on the world stage and and uh, coalition for global prosperity and you know, our Twitter handle is is Britain leads. How do we make sure that Britain does lead? And I think. Obviously, the military is incredibly important, and we've talked about that at length today, but the soft power dynamic element in that conversation is, in my view, really, really important. And the role of international development and the aid budget is, is very vital in that conversation. And therefore, I hope that when we have these discussions looking forward as to what is the next chapter of Afghanistan and the region, we really look at it holistically and look at the role that international development and support to 
organisation like Pain and Trust, which having 81% cut is unacceptable. How do we move? How do we change that? How do we address it? How do we look at it in a sort of more holistic way, as I said earlier? That, for me, is the real key um, as to how we address the next chapter for cancer. Thank you, Laura. James? So I, I was um, trained as a soldier to conduct what's called a military estimate, which is a sort of objective analysis of a problem, look at all the various factors and come to some a workable plan. Now, one of the things you have to ask yourself in doing a military estimate is what is the most likely outcome and what is the most dangerous outcome? And when the two things uh, come together, then you really do have a problem. And there is a quite significant chance right now that the most likely and the most dangerous are the same thing. Namely, that uh, the Taliban descend into uh, the most hardline version uh, that we could fear. And we need to think, what do we want Afghanistan to look like in 10 years that is actually realistic? And plot back from that, mm -hmm. and I believe it is uh, a moderate Taliban regime, probably no nicer than that which rules Saudi Arabia, an ally, uh, but which is allowing women to go into the workplace, if, albeit segregated, which allows girls to go to school, albeit segregated, which does not export international terrorism, and which is not a destabilizing uh, influence on the region. That is something that is achievable if we put our minds to it. I'll stop. Chapman. Look, the question we're here to answer, uh, we're sitting here to answer today is Afghanistan's next chapter and what that means. I guess I would just would like to make a simple statement of please use your voices moving forward in whatever capacity you can whether it's simply to write to your MP and ask them to raise a question in the House of Commons or to get um, to hold events like this, hold meetings like this and, and write petitions um, and just use any means within your capability to make sure that Afghanistan is not completely silenced and abandoned. I hear every single day uh, reports of internet and Wi-Fi being cut across the country. Taliban are trying to find means for us not to hear what's happening on the, on the ground. And I get most of my information from my family and those that are still in Kabul and, and other provinces. But that doesn't mean that the rest of you will hear. I mean, I'm, I'm from Afghanistan, so it's easier for me to get that information. But for the majority of the public, slowly and slowly and eventually, you will start to hear less and less. That should be concerning, not only for the people of Afghanistan, but for us here internationally. When we talk about the Taliban and their extreme narratives and their anti-Western policies and, and way of life, it also means that they are going to be opening doors, and they have already, to our enemies, including the Al-Qaeda, including ISIS-K, which is now a new group in Afghanistan that didn't exist before 2001, and so many others are going to breed and use the country and the land of Afghanistan for their own extremist and terrorist narratives, and that will end up within our shores if we don't pay attention. So I urge you to please do speak up, talk about Afghanistan, talk about its women, talk about its children, talk about the humanitarian crisis, talk about, talk about education and the fact that girls are banned from school now. These are important things that we need to continue to persist and show Britain's commitment globally. And whilst we've left militarily, it does not mean we need to also leave Afghanistan in every other means. So please do speak up. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Uh, well, on the question of the ISI Pakistan, I simply do not believe the Taliban would have been able to make progress at the rate they did without the assistance of the ISI. So I think, we, I think that we need to be clear about this. And, and the idea that they were not involved uh, is about as credible as the fact that they didn't know Osama bin Laden was living just outside of uh, a Pakistani military school. Um, and when it comes to um, uh, the future of the people of Afghanistan, I'm afraid that if the Taliban don't honour their promises and they turn out, as James suggested, at the more malign end of the spectrum, then the future is grim for the people of Afghanistan and there'll be very little that we can do about it. And when we decided that for a relatively small amount of money and a relatively small number of troops remaining there, uh, that we were, we were going to, to, to leave entirely, as I said, in this very purest way, that was the point at which we were unable to really affect the future in the way that we would have liked and the way that we sacrificed in order to be able to do. Uh, again, I, I think that we are witnessing uh, a truly appalling uh, failure of, uh, of, of statecraft and, and geopolitics. Mm -hmm.
Uh, US accountability over what they left, I mean, I guess only to their taxpayer. I know that um, the question was asked within the MOD whether if we flew a load of RAF pilots to Kabul, we could have had the helicopters, uh, but, um, <laughs> but we couldn't. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and an extraordinary uh, amount of kit left behind. I, I've got at home an 1852 Lee Enfield rifle that had been left in Afghanistan after one of our previous excursions there. Um, and you know, we have to be realistic about how the stuff that's been left behind after this most recent excursion will proliferate, and that is a cause for concern. Um, so you, I think the message we've been delivering throughout, actually across the panel, has been one of pragmatism. Um, but I, I don't think we can rush. I think that the Taliban, you know, for, for all that we hear about the humanitarian crisis and potentially the role of freezing assets and withdrawal of aid in that, <coughs> we, must ex we must pressure the Taliban to operate in a certain way. They are, their, their, their politics uh, are divided and, uh, and Taliban is a country of 35 million people. Now they, you can, unfortunately, brutally suppress that number of people, but it's not easy. And those people have had an experience over the last 20 years that they will not willingly give up. And that's the, that's the thing that should give us most hope, not the ability of the international community to pull levers, because I think we're going to struggle to find consensus in the international community. It is that reality that trying to keep a lid on dissent of a country of 35 million people is not easy. And the international community cannot abandon them to their fate. So you're right, I have to answer a bit more diplomatically, but all countries in the region have their agendas. We need to sort of understand those agendas and seek to navigate a course uh, within that. Um, the history of our interventions in Afghanistan, any, any foreign intervention in Afghanistan, is not great. But the problem is that Afghanistan, when left to its own devices, hasn't had a great history either. Um, and that is a challenge. That means that the international community the expectations of the Afghan people and the pressure that undoubtedly will be applied by great organisations like the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan will need to keep policymakers in the international community focused on the challenge at hand and indeed you know, those who are in Afghanistan need to make sure that the Taliban realise they can't just do it all with an eye for theocratic purity and that they do have a population that they are going to need to govern and that that population gets a vote, albeit perhaps not a democratic one, but one through their ability to protest and dissent if the Taliban go in the direction that they don't want them to. Les Jeunes, I, I, I wish I could sit here full of optimism and sort of draw a line under the interventions of the last 20 years saying, well, what a wonderful success that was. The integrated review has if you want to see the lessons that have been learned by Afghanistan, read the integrated review. They're there for all to see. We have already adjusted the way we want to do our business. So too has the United States, France, all of our key allies. Um, we've got to make sure we do things better in the future when we intervene in parts of the world that require our intervention. But we also can't turn our back on the parts of the world where we've been for the last 20 years and where it probably hasn't gone all that well, to be frank. And that's why this is important and the measure of um, its importance going on will be whether you can get an event like this to be so well attended in a year's time. I really hope you can. Thank you, all. Thank you all so much for being here. And we've run over slightly, but I think that's testament to how uh, the strength of the opinion here.